I'm absolutely delighted to be joined next by Benali Hamdash. Uh, Benali is the Green Party of England and Wales's migration spokesperson, and we're going to be talking about the Green Party's new policies on migration that were passed at Spring Conference just last week. Before we delve into any of that, uh, Benali, it's an absolute pleasure to be joined by you again. How are you doing? Yeah, not bad. Uh, day of door knocking, been out talking to residents, so you know the work never stops. Fun, fun, fun. Well, I hope you found nothing but green voters and the casework was easily resolved. Um, so I mentioned it there. Last weekend, the Green Party passed a suite of new policies on migration. Can you talk us through the key elements of the new policies? Well, I mean, just to kick it off, I think we should be really proud uh, of our values that are on display when we pass this motion. I think we are really leading the way uh, in England and Wales for, for a, you know, a, a principled, inclusive vision for what migration uh, looks like. And that understanding that we should not be putting violence at our borders or treating migrants uh, unfairly. Um, so there's 10 key principles uh, in this new chapter. Um, and again, you know, really leading the way. Um, number one, uh, giving the right to family reunification, I think is such a valuable piece of our policy. And it's about also extending that to grandchildren and grandparents uh, and siblings. Um, now, when we looked at the huge crisis in Ukraine, um, the government expanded the right for family reunification, but only for Ukrainians. Uh, now, there are so many other nationalities in the world where people are have split families, are facing conflict, just thinking of Yemen, thinking of Afghanistan. Um, their rights to be able to reunite, re reunite with their family are much more curtailed. And I think actually our position to make sure that it's open to everyone uh, and open to more families is something we should be proud of and something we should be getting out to communities to let them know that we're on their side. Um, another really positive part of the policy is about letting all migrants vote. Um, I always think about, you know, that mantra of no, ta no taxation without representation. Uh, but there's a huge group of people who have the right to live in this country who have no ability to influence. Um, it's very recommend um, no ability to influence the government. Um, you know, you've got a situation where a Commonwealth citizen who's just newly arrived is allowed to vote. But a US citizen who's been here for 10 years or an EU citizen might not be able to vote in the general election. Um, Actually letting everyone who's got a right to live here um, to vote, I think, is something that's really powerful. It's about community building. It's making sure that everyone's voice is heard. Uh, and I think would make a massive, massive difference. Um, our migration policy would also uh, scrap the no recourse to public funds condition, um, something that Boris Johnson promised to look into not long ago. Um, but we have a situation where people have the right to live here, but have no right to claim um welfare or assistance which has left so many families and so many households destitute homeless in crisis uh, especially when we think of the pandemic when so many people lost work uh, and you know now in the cost of living crisis as well um giving an entire group of people no safety net is immoral and unjust and actually causes more kind of issues because councils have to kind of step in to help destitute families when you know an intervention sooner could have made a massive difference so um yeah it's something that we should be proud to be standing against um another thing is about the end of uh, profiteering from visa fees um, there's been a huge explosion in fees that people can face trying to get a visa you know one of the things that we haven't actually been talking about is the huge privatization that's been sleeping into this sector more and more companies making profits from processing visa applications which increasingly is a poorer and poorer service so they're making money and people are finding it harder to get uh, visas that are entitled to so taking that out really important and i'll just i'll finish uh with one more um and it's about like not detaining people um, when they're because of their immigration status. Um, we know that places like Yarl's Wood um, are inhumane, are inhospitable, and there's too many cases of migrants being treated really abysmally, again, in quite often privatised, run-for-profit 
prisons um and we know that you know the, the home office recently did a trial of not detaining people and surprisingly it worked out all right but they're you know under sorella braverman uh they're not going to do that right now but i'm proud that the green party stands against detention so i'm going to pick up on a few of those points uh, to start with family reunification so this is something that i don't think is a major point of conversation in sort of the media representation of migration or the national conversation around it. Why do you think that the issue of family reunification is so important uh, from a kind of, if we if we think of a migration system from uh, a kind of humanitarian perspective, why do you think that issue is so important? Well, you know, I, I, I remember recently speaking to a, a, a Yemeni woman who had talked about the fact that her sister had died before she was able to help her to come over to this country. You know, Yemen has had a civil civil war for seven years. Yemen is also a former British colony. Uh, Yemen is also somewhere where um, we've sold weapons to the Saudis that have then used it to commit war crimes in that country. We owe Yemen a huge moral debt that we're not repaying at all right now uh and you know yemeni steel workers help build this country yemeni sailors are a huge part of you know the british story of what this country became and yet there are british yemeni citizens today who can't bring family members to safety and you know I, I, again i was talking to, to this woman and she was saying you know we think it's right that the Ukrainians have been given safe harbour, but why don't we have those rights? And for a country that we have actually quite deep connections with, it, it feels incredibly immoral and incredibly unjust. And I think what is really important about uh, this policy is we're treating all nationalities equally uh, and we're exposing the inequity that is in the system right now. And you know, family is family, right? Like your loved ones, uh, the people that, you know, raised you or your connections. And, you know, I think also our our family reunification rules have been very bound by kind of a Western sensibilities of what a family is. But, you know, I think my Algerian family, right? My, quite a lot of my aunt, one of my uncles will live with my grandparents. That's what a family unit is. And so um, our definition of who, constitutes a close enough family member to be brought over is 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 very specific to us um but you know isn't necessarily particularly fair um so i think there is a really powerful offer here and i think you know we should be getting this message out to communities that we represent and letting them know that the green party is the only party i think uh, really in england and wales putting this forward and would, would would be the the party that would stop separating families and I think that's such a powerful message. And so voting rights, this is one of the areas that I can imagine the Daily Mail and the Express having an absolute field day with. Uh, What's the case for giving uh, visa residents the right to vote? Well, you know, I, 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 first of all, I'd love to be in the Daily Mail. I think it'd be, a, you know, it's always a, a good a good day when the, the Daily Mail do a Green Party page of shame. I think it's always, I, I, you know, some, some of the proudest moments I can think of the Green Party is the times the Daily Mail have had a bit of a go. Um, but, you know, I think I think the rules are really arbitrary right now. It is it is very, I mean, I know, I know an Australian citizen who voted in the EU referendum so that the uh, the Australian currency that they had in their in their bank account would uh, appreciate, and you know, it all worked out for her. But meanwhile, you know, there are EU citizens who have raised family here, who have contributed, who weren't allowed to vote in that referendum, and it it should never have been the case. Um, I think the idea that you're part of a community and you're allowed to have a say in how that community is run. It's just a fundamental right. And it shouldn't be that controversial, I don't think. Um, it is. Um, but it shouldn't be. And I think, you know, it's. I think the Greens, again, have led the way on, on voting rights. Like we're, we're championing vote, voting for 16 and 17-year-olds. And it's another front for us to talk about. And, you know, 
there, there's been a lot of kind of you know there was a lot of uncertainty about whether or not EU citizens would keep their right to vote in local elections, but they should be allowed to vote in the general elections as well. And I think again, we need to get that message out there that we are championing this because I think it's something that will make people take a second look at the Green Party. And so before I get your thoughts on the government's latest anti-migrant legislation, I just wanted to ask about detention because that was something that you mentioned there. Um, for some, some of our viewers won't be kind of aware about the current system of detention when it comes to migration. So I wondered if you could talk through a little bit like the conditions in detention centres, what detention in the UK looks like, and I guess why uh, the Greens want to end detention. I mean, well, we shouldn't. Let's start with what happened with uh, Manson uh, most recently. Like this was meant to be a temporary holding uh, in a uh, detention centre where people were never meant to be there for more than 48, 72 hours. People were in that centre for weeks, weeks and weeks and weeks, sleeping on the floor, you know, overcrowded, horrendous conditions, you know, a level of closeness that meant that illnesses were being passed between the kind of people in that detention centre. Um, truly horrifying conditions that should embarrass us for the fact that our government allowed this to happen. Um, I mean, Suella Braverman was clearly failing in her legal obligations to provide fit and proper standards for people who are just trying to claim asylum. Um, that was a real new low. Uh, and I think we should be highlighting and not letting the government forget what they did there. Um, but yeah, in too many instances when people are awaiting uh, removal, people quite often are detained uh, in, in, in what are prisons. Um, and there's so many examples of, you know, staff, a, a, a abuse there's examples of it um you know of you know self-harm of suicide, of suicide attempts in, in these in, in these centers um and i think the thing that I, I know we're going to talk about it a little bit later um but one of the things that the illegal migration bill going through parliament right, right now is promising to do is to massively expand the carceral state for refugees and migrants and we only have to look to australia know what the implications of that you know some of the stories of psychologists who worked in those kind of island prison camps that australia was was instituting are truly horrifying levels of self-harm and suicide and mental health crises through the like on an unimaginable scale um and you know the the amount of financing required to detain people on the scale that uh, the government is promising is is going to be mind boggling. I mean, you know, this is the government that promised however many hospitals and has only delivered a handful, but it's promising to, you know, detain tens of thousands of people. Um, you know, it's going to be if you know if it does come to fruition, it's going to be it's going to be horrific. So you mentioned the bill there, and last time you came on the show, we were talking about another series of anti-migrant policies that we're introducing, but this is the latest one, the new illegal migration bill. What's your what's your take on that legislation? What's your reflections um, on, on the bill as it's currently formulated? Well, I mean, you know, I think I'm never surprised, I, mean, I keep getting surprised by uh, the Conservative government's ability to surprise us with new levels of cruelty it's it's never ending uh you know the nationality and borders bill was one of the biggest attacks on refugee and migrant rights in decades this represents a new threshold um you know i think there's lots of reasons why to think this bill will not achieve its goals and i have to say that it really deeply worries me for the implications of that you know I think ultimately we should be really crystal clear in saying this is an asylum ban. This is saying that this country will no longer take in refugees. It will pick and choose certain small groups that it might favour. And I think we have to kind of really underline the, the racism in that. You know, a lot of Tory MPs are very proud about the number of Ukrainians and Hong Kongers that, they, that have been welcomed to this country, which is good. But 
the government's policy is going to be to select and pick by nationality and play favourites and to turn away anyone else who isn't under one of the schemes the government opens. Um, and again, like even when they do have a uh, a scheme for resetting, say, Afghan refugees, it, it, it's it's not delivering. So this is a, this is an asylum ban. This is a huge amount of political theatre. Um, it is, you know, the it feels like a last dice roll of this government's attempt to hold on at the next general election. I um, mean, you know, I think this is the only topic where le- the Tories are more trusted than Labour. And so they would dearly love for this election to be solely about um, refugees. Um, and so, you know, suspending the human rights of refugees, uh, detaining people on a massive level, you know, sending people back regardless of how meritous their their asylum claim is. Um, you know, there are lots of reasons why to think that this is a very ripe contender for legal challenge. Um, you know, the fact is no one has been sent to Rwanda yet. And this is an even <laughs> grosser attack on kind of the legal rights that are already enshrined. So, you know, there are lots of reasons to believe or be optimistic about it, what the courts might say. But then ultimately, this government is promising the undeliverable. And I really worry what that means for the far right and how much opportunity they will have to capitalise on this. We've already seen, you know, the the hotel fire, the, the attack in Knowlesley, you know, far right activists going out into hotels, filming uh, refugees, intimidating them has been going on for a long, long time. You have to be deeply concerned about what another broken promise about undeliverable levels of cruelty will do to the far right recruiting and organising. Um, and so, you know, the government has to really seriously think about what the, the what they're fanning the fuel of. So before I let you go, I want to ask you about the Labour Party, which you mentioned briefly there. But um, what do you make of Labour's response to this latest piece of legislation and more broadly uh, in under their current leadership, the uh, approach they've taken on migration? Well, we can all see the creeping triangulation, right? Um, despite what some might deny, um, the language of how Labour talks about immigration does not sound like it did under Jeremy Corbyn, which wasn't always perfect. You know, there were definitely times where, uh, you know, Jeremy's rhetoric got criticised rightfully for for how, how we might talk about immigration. But this is a whole new level. I mean, you know, Keir Starmer had 10 pledges. Uh, can, you, can you remember one of them it was was defend free movement? And we can all see how far we've come from that today. Um, you know, I think we shouldn't forget as well that Yvette Cooper has been shadow home secretary before and under her stewardship the labor party did not vote against the 2014 immigration bill which caused the windrush crisis there were 16 mps who voted against it at every level one of them was jerry corbyn one of them was caroline lucas um and you know there are increasingly noises coming from labor hq briefing about you know a hard more and more hardening rhetoric you know the the number one line from the Labour Party right now to respond to refugees and crossing the channel is not safe and legal routes. It's crack down on criminal gangs. It's the tone is increasingly hard to tell the difference from the Tories. And, you know, they are not making a moral argument against what they're proposing. Their argument is what the Tories are doing won't work. Well, I mean, what the Tories are aiming for is cruelty and they're quite good at that. A pretty bleak note to end on, but nonetheless, I'm going to let you get on and enjoy the rest of your Sunday evening. Uh, thank you so much for joining us again, Benali. Pleasure. Oh, I've just, sorry, before I let you go, I've just seen a question jumped in last minute in the chat, which I am going to put to you. Um, there's a slight delay on the chat coming through to me, so I've just seen it. If that's OK, I'll put it to you. Um, and then we'll have to do that weird, awkward uh, goodbye again. Um, <laughs> but uh, Luckily, I can edit that out in, in future videos. Um, 
But uh, Zoe Garbett has asked, uh, given that Green Party policy is unlikely to be implemented anytime soon, what can people be doing now to influence change? And that's a much more positive note to end on than what I was going to. So thanks, Zoe. Yeah, thank you, Zoe. Um, no, 100%. I think, you know, I think, A, I think volunteering um, with charities that support refugees and migrants is honestly one of the most valuable things we can do. I think there's a lot of stress and anxiety and fear out in the community right now and anything that we can do to you know bolster support civil services uh you know and there's some great charities out there providing great tailored support and you know community services community activity um if we can support them with our money and our time then i think that can make a real difference i think there's also a lot of work that we could do on a local level to make sure that councils are resisting the Home Office on this front, whether that's passing city sanctuary motions. Um, I mean, really proud that in Islington, our homelessness services don't cooperate with the Home home Office and don't update or share details of people's uh, immigration status. Um, That's really important and really valuable and getting your local council to do the same should be a a priority. and yeah, I mean, like, get politically involved. I mean, I, I honestly think um, the Green Party's role on this is so important. And joining or getting involved and helping us grow our voice on this is in face of what I think is kind of going to be one of the defining moral decisions and debates of our time um, is something that can make a real difference. And, you know, we know that when we win elections and when we do successfully our voice is loud and we get heard more and so the local elections are coming up in may uh there's a good opportunity for us to get more councillors and just to link it when we do well like that then we get more coverage for our policies like this well i am now going to let you leave Nali. so once again it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for joining me pleasure bye-bye